In 2021, Ukraine had 50 gigawatts of installed power capacity and as of today, it has less than 20 gigawatts. This comes as a result of the invader prioritizing crimes against humanity over strikes on military targets and the textbook solution to this is to stop the criminal, but that's a story for another time. I fully support the implementation of this solution by any means necessary, but today's video is about what can be done in the meantime. If Ukraine can't have a conventional centralized energy system, then it must have a decentralized energy system and to a large extent it already kind of does, primarily using diesel generators. These generators are one of the conventional solutions, but they are not enough. And the reason why I'm making today's video is because I believe that I see several more unconventional solutions which are not being considered as seriously as they should be. And I'm hoping that by publishing them like this with a detailed explanation, it can help make a difference. I'm going to publish three videos on this topic, so hello YouTube. I'm Michael Size, and for video number one, I want to cover the topic of solid fuel heating, which is probably the most misunderstood one of the topics that I'll be covering during this time. Obviously everyone is aware that you can burn wood to make heat or you can even burn coal, but for most people this seems to be sort of an abstract concept and not something that they can actually imagine themselves doing in their own home. But today I'm going to explain how you can burn wood or coal for heating safely, cheaply and reliably in your own home even inside of an apartment. And obviously if you can get this to work in an apartment then getting it to work in a house is is only going to be easier, so I'm going to talk today as if we are implementing the apartment scenario. Starting off with the most important part of the wood stove, which is the flue pipe. This is extremely serious, I'm not joking, and you should not even think about burning stuff indoors until you understand the purpose and operation of the flue pipe. It is the most important part of the whole system, so pay attention. Because at steady state operation, the flue pipe is full of hot combustion gases, and because they're hot, that means that they're lower density than regular air, and because they're lower density, they try to rise up exactly like how a hot air balloon works. And as a result, the flue pipe is pumping hot gases out of the top end, and correspondingly, it is sucking in air at the bottom end. This is the part that actually matters. The flue pipe is what's sucking in air at the bottom end and this suction has to be directed into the firebox and this is what makes the firebox suck air in. So obviously this is what provides the oxygen that the wood requires in order to burn but even more importantly the suction is what makes sure that the combustion gases are pulled into the flue pipe and outside of the living space and that this is what allows you to burn fuel in your home without killing everyone inside by asphyxiation. So the flue pipe doesn't merely direct the gases, the flue pipe is what makes the gases move in the first place. And it does this by using the difference in temperature which makes it in many ways a thermal engine. It might look like a sewer pipe, but it is much more similar to an extraction fan, so you have to make sure that it's working properly. Now obviously the longer the pipe, the more suction is going to be able to create and if you have too much suction, you can usually restrict it before it enters the firebox. So a lot of the time the advice is simply longer the better. This is one of the reasons why you might see them running all the way up the building, although this is also to prevent smoke from staining the building. So generally the longer the better, but you can get away with much shorter flue pipes in practice. I actually know of people IRL who have actually installed stoves in apartments like this here in Eastern Europe in old communist apartment blocks and what they found is that simply mounting the stove close to the floor and pulling the flue pipe up to near the ceiling is enough length to create the required draft for a small stove, so about 2 meters. This works not only because the stove is small, but also because it's fairly inefficient, possibly putting as much as 200 degrees Celsius out the flue pipe. And this is good for two reasons. First of all, if your flue pipe had to go all the way up the apartment building, well that's a lot of professional work to install it, and there's no way that this can be retrofitted on a 
large scale in Ukraine by this heating season, but if you can get away with a 2 meter pipe mounted entirely indoors, then the project is well within DIY territory. And additionally, advantage number 2 is that this makes scheduled maintenance much easier, particularly the cleaning. Now, if combustion gases are going out of the living space, this means that fresh air must be coming in from inside the living space, which in turn means that fresh air must be entering the living space from somewhere, and this can be as easy as having a window slightly open, or you could make a dedicated hole in the wall close to the firebox. Either work well, but this process of air exchange does tend to dry out your living space, since cold air is extremely dry and this isn't necessarily a problem, although it might cause discomfort in some people, such as itchy skin or red eyes, and the solution is as simple as making sure to have a cup of water on the stove at all times, replenishing the moisture. So that's everything about the flue pipe, now let's talk about how these things actually heat the home. Because in principle, there's a fire inside of a big metal box, and the fire heats the metal box, and the box radiates heat heat just like a radiator, except it's way hotter than a radiator. This makes it great for heating one room, but not so great for heating multiple rooms, although with a hot stove in a tiny apartment, with the interior walls lacking any insulation, and with keeping the doors open, well it's not ideal, but it's way better than having no heat at all. The top of the stove gets hot enough to cook food on it, and that's super cute, although the heating power that actually makes it into the cookware is going to be quite a bit lower than on a gas stove. This also means that you can heat water on the stove, and this opens up the possibility of making hot water for purposes such as bathing or doing the dishes, and you can even use hot water as a way to transport heat manually. Just treat hot water with respect, but it can be done. As I said, a stove like this is DIY friendly, which is a massive advantage. You put a sheet of steel on the floor, you put a stove on top of it, you drill a big hole in the wall, you shove the flue pipe in it, you insulate around the flue pipe with fiberglass, connect the flue pipe to the stove, seal that connection, probably with high temperature silicone, and you're all done. You can now make a fire in it, and that's what we call a stove. However, if you're feeling ambitious, a wood stove can be upgraded to a wood boiler, and there are two ways. Number one, you put a pot of water on the stove and you put a loop of copper pipe inside that pot and you connect the loop to your hydronic system, obviously you add an expansion tank and an electric pump for circulation, and this way you can heat the water in your hydronic system. But this setup will have limited power, I did say that you can boil water on the stove, but I also said that it's not as fast as a gas stove, so if you want more power you're gonna have to go to number two, which is putting the copper loop inside the firebox. Or I think they make stainless steel loops for these higher temperatures, but you put the loop inside the firebox and that's going to get you a lot more power. Or alternatively, you can even find stoves for purchase that already have a loop built in like this. But pay attention. Because what I'm about to say now is as important as the flue pipe. As soon as the loop goes inside the firebox, you open up the possibility of a steam explosion if the water circulation ever stops. And this means that you must install a pressure relief valve, this is mandatory, and you also should have a UPS that can continue to power the circulating pump even in the event of a power outage. And this is highly recommended. And finally, if you're going to build boilers, maybe ask for advice from some actual plumber first. But that's enough about the equipment, now let's talk about fuel. The first thing that comes to mind is naturally wood. It burns nice and predictable, it makes smoke when you first start it and when you add fuel, but doesn't really make smoke for most of the burn, and for the smoke that it does make, the smell of it is generally considered pleasant. Next up is coal, and coal comes in many forms. Lignite or brown coal makes smoke all throughout the burn, so this is probably not what you want to burn in a stove in the middle of the city. Black coal is a higher grade than lignite, but it still makes smoke 
smoke all throughout the burn. However, the highest grade of coal, hard coal, also known as anthracite, does not make smoke. And other smokeless solid fossil fuels can be manufactured from brown and black coal via pyrolysis. This makes a product which is known as coke, kind of synthetic anthracite in a way. Other smokeless fuels can be made as a byproduct of oil refining, and this is known as pet coke. In terms of flame quality, generally speaking, coal is difficult to ignite, and you might need a wood fire first, but once it does ignite, you can keep adding coal for as long as you keep the fire going. And the smell that coal makes when it burns is generally considered less pleasant than wood. And the third option is modern biomass. Now, obviously biomass pellets would be a chore to burn in a stove like this, but biomass briquettes would burn like logs and they're a really good idea. They can be made from wood, of course, but they can also be made from all sorts of other biomass, such as wheat straw or soybean straw, corn stalks or sunflower seed husk or leaves or really anything. These briquettes burn almost as well as wood, they smell about as nice as wood, but most of them do generate a whole lot more ash compared to wood. So to recap the fuels, we have wood, coal and biomass as the three conventional solid fuel options, but I know that people are going to attempt to burn trash in these stoves, so I'm going to address that topic as well to the best of my knowledge. Plastic burns poorly, it's most likely going to melt into a puddle and it's going to generate black smoke all throughout the burn process. The smell of burning plastic is terrible and it basically smells like poison, although I don't think that it actually is more poisonous than wood smoke, it just smells a lot worse. But there's one exception to this poison, which is PVC. Please do not burn PVC under any circumstances. Paper burns with some smoke, lots of ash, and that characteristic paper fire smell. And while a kilogram of paper does make as much heat as one kilogram of wood, I can tell you right now that if you actually try to burn it, you're going to find that doing so is an absolute chore. Paper is much fluffier than you'd think, it's much more difficult to rip apart than you'd think, and the flame that it makes is much less predictable than you'd expect, so you can try it, but I think you're going to give up on the idea pretty quickly. Now I'm also gonna say that it might feel like a modern household generates a lot of trash, but once you actually weigh it, you'll find that it's mostly just fluffy, and there are very few actual kilograms in there. As a ballpark estimate, if you collect all of your trash for the whole year, you can probably supply no more than 5% of your heating needs with it. But there's one exception, and that exception is cotton textiles, and especially jeans. If you fold them up, they're sufficient compact to burn like a log and they also smell like a log so burning them for heat is a better idea than just tossing them in the garbage. Now this does not apply to other textiles, obviously polyester is just plastic so it's gonna burn like plastic and wool smells like burnt hair and releases cyanide. I'm not saying that it has to be 100% cotton in order to burn nicely but it probably should be at least 80% I think. Now most of these fuels can be found for purchase in Ukraine. In fact, many of the products on digital shelves in my country are imported from Ukraine as well, particularly straw briquettes and coal. This is important because when I've run this idea by other people, a common question has been about logistics. How do we get the fuel to Ukraine and how do we get the stoves to Ukraine and to that I say, leave the logistics to the professionals. The existing retailers, both online as well as brick and mortar in Ukraine, are going to have the skills and infrastructure necessary to get these products to buyers in Ukraine just like they get all of the other products. And if you want to directly help Ukrainians with this, it would probably be easiest to just reimburse their receipts or directly order products to their address. And finally, the last safety note I'm going to make in this video is to point out the issue of ash. In a stove, you're going to be removing ash possibly on a continuous
continuous basis so it may be hot and it may have smoldering embers inside. You should make sure that this ash doesn't melt your trash can and you should make sure that it doesn't set your trash can on fire and you should definitely make sure that it doesn't smolder inside the living space and asphyxiate you. In fact you should always treat the ash with the assumptions that there are still smoldering embers inside. As I've said in the beginning, this is not a proper solution. The proper solution is strategic bombers, but beware of the comments who are going to tell you that this is not a solution at all, because they are demonstrably incorrect. Individual wood and coal stoves in every unit is how apartment buildings were heated in New York City as recently as 100 years ago, and also in London as recently as 70 years ago. And if it works for the two capitals of the world, it's going to work for the capitals of Europe as well. But as it turns out, we don't have to look at the buildings of a hundred years ago, because this is actually a big thing in Eastern Europe today, in almost the exact same context that Ukraine is facing. See, in former communist Europe, many apartments used to be heated by small-scale district heating networks, and after 1990 many of these networks failed economically and were shut down. Now, I was under the impression that whenever this happened, Happened, apartment dwellers would simply install combi boilers and that's problem solved, but while that is a common solution, what I hadn't considered is that there are settlements without a natural gas connection. People cook on LPG, the residents of detached homes in those settlements heat their homes with wood of course, and the old district heating networks used to run on coal, so the closest gas infrastructure is miles away and potentially tens of miles. The district heating is gone, so wood stoves are the only option left. But now also remember that this infrastructure has to go up basically overnight, because whenever you learn that the district heating is not going to be working next winter, well that means that you have less than 6 months to go until the start of the heating season. So basically these people were in the exact same situation that Ukraine finds itself in when the Russians bomb a district heating facility, it has to be done by this winter. So you can see that in terms of heating, this sort of of strategy is absolutely viable on a large scale quickly, but you might have noticed that it also makes the neighborhoods kind of look very bad. But you don't have to give in to ugliness either. Let's take a look back at the 20th century. You can see in these images from New York City in the 1900s, it's a three level building, so that means three coal stoves, all installed in the same area of each unit, so you have three flue pipes bundled together at the top. And in this image from London in the 1950s, you have five levels, which is five coal stoves, so five flue pipes bundled together in this brick chimney. Following this concept, the HOA of a condominium could vote where in the apartment the wood stove should go and everyone installs it in roughly the same location, runs the flue pipes along roughly the same line vertically and then it can all be encapsulated with a brick chimney for aesthetics. This doesn't have to be done all at once, it doesn't have to be completed during wartime, first of all, you can simply run the pipes now and build a chimney several years later, or even further, you could run short pipes that can be installed completely DIY this year, and then once the war is won, you can lengthen the pipes, clean the facades of soot, and build a chimney. In conclusion, if you had any doubts about the viability of this idea, now you have them no more. It has literally been deployed in practice and proven to work. Thank you for watching and I plan to make another two videos on the topic of winter in Ukraine. I'll try to complete them as soon as possible and if you think they're going to be useful at all, you should like and subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to reply if I believe I have useful information to share.